John chapter 6, 56 through 69. Listen for the word of the living God as we read these words. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live into the age. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the breath that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are breath and life. But among you are, there are some who do not trust. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not trust and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered to him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of enduring life. We have come to trust and know that you are the Holy One of God. The living God still speaks today. Thanks be to God. Sometimes I get tired of hearing the same story over and over and over. When our kids were little, we read more than 400 and different books to them over a summer. That was a lot of reading, but it was mostly varied. One of those books, however, we read at least 30 times. I did manage to add some variation by reading it on occasion in Spanish. You might think the kids were trying to memorize the books, not simply read them or have them read to them. On the other hand, they were intent on digesting them and getting everything out of them that was possible. When Jesus repeats himself, do we get tired of hearing the same? Or do we look for something we might have missed the first time around? For three Sundays now, we've been reading of Jesus in John chapter 6. And on one level appears as though Jesus is stuck, like a scratched record or a CD set on repeat. He continues discussing his body and blood as food throughout this chapter of John. Much of his words seem to hit the same concept over and over and over again. On another level, however, Jesus' repeating message is not about eating his body or drinking his blood. It goes much further than just that. Eating his body and drinking his blood are just one conjoined image that he uses to convey something he has already been talking about regarding this enduring life. One phrase in today's passage is a close repeat of John 5, 24. Whoever trusts me has enduring life. 
Here it reads, whoever eats or drinks me has enduring life. They're both phrased in the present tense. They both refer to a contemporary reality, not something off in some nebulous future in the by and by. It's very similar to what we heard in John 4, in which living water gushes up to become enduring life. In chapter 3, trusting Jesus extends enduring life. Then there's another recurrent aspect of other repetitions. Jesus references abiding in him in today's passage. It's the very same language we'll find in John chapter 15. There, when Jesus is speaking of himself as the vine and us as the branches and the father, the one who prunes. In that image, we are to remain abiding in him, just like the phrasing here. It's closely tied with what we encountered in John's first chapter. About our receiving Jesus. These varied images are not exactly different teachings. They're not designed to offer distinction one from another. They are the very same message. Presented in different ways and responding to different contexts and different conversations. It's like the wedding feast in John 2. There we found Jesus turning water into wine simply in order to address a very specific need. Had their need been different, Jesus would have responded differently. He wouldn't have transformed water into wine. When Nicodemus came before Jesus at night, he spoke of regeneration and re redirected Nicodemus to a known image of trusting God when all seemed lost, when there was no other way. At the well near Sychar, Jesus spoke to the woman about a different kind of water than she had come to draw from the well. He would not have spoken of water if there had been, say, a fig tree there that she had come to harvest. In chapter 5, he spoke of being the continuation of Abraham's own trust in God, which leads to this enduring life. Here it is bread and flesh. Because we are on the heels of his feeding thousands who had followed him in search of more food and more miracles. Each of these different images, symbols, terms, word pictures that Jesus uses are different. But they work in concert to advance one single message. They focus on trust that brings us into an abiding fellowship, a joining of our lives to Jesus, through which this enduring life impacts us right now. In none of these texts does Jesus speak of eternity, per se. In none of them does he address an ephemeral future somewhere way out there in God's unreachable presence. In each one, he addresses God's coming reign, becoming a present reality today, amid our earthly, physical, human, social existence. He speaks of God's reign as a present reality to which those who trust already belong. They already have 
this enduring life. It's not something we await. It is a life into which we lean and one that we live now. It seems to me like Jesus overdoes his use of this cannibalistic imagery that we read in John 6. But again, John is not recounting one extended discourse to us. He's taking a few of the things that Jesus said over a period of days and putting them together in one thematic unit. Just like he had presented themes like living water, living word, Abraham's faith, and we'll move on to sheep and shepherd. This chapter spans several days in Jesus' ministry, but centers on one central theme like so many of his other chapters. It's the way John puts these sayings together. It makes them come across as perhaps more scandalous than they might have seemed the first time around. This image was rather offensive to some. But we might do well to recall that in the previous chapter, people were taking up stones in preparation for killing Jesus throwing him off a cliff and ending him. It was not the first time anyone had become offended by Jesus' words. It would not be the last. His message was a direct challenge to much of their history, their tradition, their understanding of God and God's purposes for life, for our life on earth for life in God's land of promise. Jesus' various images spoke of a very different reality in which God is not waiting around for a different future, a future defined by Jewish political supremacy and power. He was speaking of God reigning in our lives and through our lives right now. That was as scandalous a message for these first century Jews as it is to many of our contemporaries focused on what they call the end times, after which they expect life to truly begin. As difficult as Jesus' image of cannibalism uh, of his body may have been, this shift in perspective on the here and now was every bit as distressing as anything else that he had to say. Among those who had followed him after being fed, most were looking to install Jesus as the king of Israel in opposition to the forces and occupation of Rome. They wanted political power. They wanted the fulfillment of their long-held expectations of that future age that would be marked by military overthrow, by war, by violence, by retribution against those who had oppressed them. They were not concerned about a different character of life. They were concerned about the political context of life regarding who held the reins of power. If they were exclusively focused on a political reality of Jewish supremacy as the world power, we have likewise missed Jesus' intent. Being so taken with heaven in the by and by, it seems we leave Jesus' good news for here and now, trampled somewhere in the dust. We don't want anything to do with eating his body and drinking his blood any more than his contemporaries did. They did not want God to reign over their immediate context. 
They wanted God to change the context. They were not concerned with giving up on their dreams to embrace God's. They wanted God to swallow their ambitions, not the other way around. The life Jesus offered was not limited to any particular reality, whether social, political, or economic. Jesus offered life unlimited to or by circumstances. It did not require expelling Rome or establishing Israel as the latest and greatest world superpower. The life Jesus offered embraces any and all of those realities. It is God's reign on earth as in heaven, neither empowered by politics, advanced by politics, nor tied to any particular political structure. God's reign moves beyond any and all earthly realities. It extends even beyond the limits of death. The disciples were struggling to wrap their lives around this story. They they desperately needed to hear it again and again and again. They needed to see it from a host of new angles, from myriad new images. These were scandalous words, but they were the only words of an enduring life, as Peter puts it. Where else could they go to find a message of enduring life unlimited? and undeterred by the political and social and economic realities around them. Where can we go? These are the words of enduring life. Here, now, and continuing on. Would you join me?